In the late 19th century, a man faced the ultimate punishment and escaped with his life. Not only that, but he somehow managed to accomplish the same thing two more times. What happened? Was it simply chance? Was it divine intervention? And why has it happened countless times throughout history? In the years since this odd event, historians and scholars have both puzzled over the story. The haunting details have led many to one shocking conclusion, that there are people walking among us who seem gifted with the supernatural power of immortality, or at the very least, the ability to withstand physical injury that most of us would die from. You won't want to miss this one. In 1883, 32-year-old Englishman James Barry made a decision to leave the Bradford Police Force, but it wasn't really that much of a career change. Instead, he just moved into a different arm of law enforcement. He became an executioner, a career move he was dying to make. Clearly, this was a grim move, but John didn't have much of a choice. He had a family to feed. He needed a job. Besides that, he had learned a lot of the ins and outs of being an executioner from his friend William Marwood, the previous person who had held the job as executioner for the British state. It was dark stuff, but it was a living. James's initial job application for William's position was rejected, but he was tenacious and kept applying until finally he was granted the post of executioner. His first job came with three things an advance payment, a ticket to Edinburgh, and a stipend for room and board. And so James prepared for his trip up north to hang two men at Calton Prison. But the night before his departure, he suffered a disturbing nightmare. He was standing at the gallows, ready to hang a man, but each time he pulled the lever, the gallows failed to open. For someone just starting his job as a hangman, it was a troubling dream, one that would plague him for years afterward. Little did James know it wasn't a dream, nor was it a nightmare. It was a prophecy, but it didn't come true right away. James's first job went off as planned. In fact, it was the beginning of a celebrated career. Over the years, James Barry would become one of England's most famous hangmen, refining the process into more humane methods of execution. As England's first literate executioner, he even wrote a lengthy memoir about his years of serving as a British state hangman. But James Barry's career as an executioner would be overshadowed by a strange series of events in late 1885. That was the year that he would meet the man they could not hang. Late the year before, a body was discovered in a residence at Babacombe Bay right near Torquay. The corpse was badly beaten and its clothes had been soaked in lamp oil and set on fire. The victim was Miss Emma Whitehead Keys. Well, there were three primary suspects. One was the servant who discovered Emma's body, Elizabeth Harris. The other was Emma's cook. The third was Elizabeth's half-brother, a young footman by the name of John Lee. This 19-year-old servant would soon become famous as the man who couldn't be killed, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Slowly, it became apparent that the cards were stacked against John. For starters, he had a criminal record as a petty thief. Not good. In fact, Emma had only hired John because he was Elizabeth's sibling and he needed a job. Today, John's record wouldn't be that big of a deal. But times were different back then, and there was some evidence pointing to John. Granted, it was all circumstantial and pretty flimsy, but it was there. Some of John's clothes were stained with blood. John had been seen loitering around the pantry just before the fire broke out, and law enforcement discovered an empty can of lamp oil there. But John maintained his innocence. While he couldn't account for the empty oil can, the blood, he said, was his own. He had cut his hand breaking a window to let out the smoke from the fire. What's more, officers who arrived at the scene found John in tears, crying over and over again. I've lost my best friend. If he had really killed his employer, 
it would have made much more sense to flee the scene of the crime. Given the time period, the fact that he was the only man in the house at the time was damning evidence, especially when combined with the blood in the empty oil can. On top of that, the prosecution argued that Emma had just cut his wages in half a few weeks earlier, giving him a possible motive. And so John Lee was found guilty of murder, but he swore that they had the wrong guy. Moments before the sentence was announced, John declared, I am innocent. The Lord will never permit me to be executed. And then the judge spoke the words. John Lee was to be hanged for the murder of Emma Whitehead Keys. The murder happened in November, so it wasn't until early the next year that the trial was complete and the execution scheduled. So John was forced to languish in a cell in the meantime. During his imprisonment, several people visited him, including a chaplain in the night before his scheduled execution date of February 23rd, 1885. They asked John why his half-sister hadn't come to his rescue. Well, John simply shrugged. He said, Elizabeth Harris could say the word which could clear me if she would. This simple statement later led to many people proposing an alternative killer. You see, rumors had begun to circulate that Emma had actually caught her servant girl in um, a compromising situation, let's say with another man on her property. Emma objected to such immorality in her house. An argument ensued and Elizabeth struck out at her employer, accidentally killing her. That girl has got a good right hook. Elizabeth and her lover then staged the crime to implicate John Lee, including planting the empty oil can in the pantry. But it made no difference. It was too late. John was going to hang the following day. Later, it would come out that the night before he was scheduled to hang, John Lee had a dream exactly like the one that tormented James Barry. Remember how he said that James had a reoccurring nightmare about failing to execute someone? Well, the dream that John had the night before his scheduled execution was exactly like that. The only difference, it was John in the noose rather than pulling the lever. But both dreams ended the same way. The trap door did not swing open. His life was spared. Remember James Barry? Well, now he re-enters our story. You see, James was the hangman selected to carry out John Lee's sentencing. And by the time February 23rd, 1885 rolled around, James Barry had tested the gallows at Exeter Prison, and they worked just fine. Everything was ready for John Lee's execution. James led John up the steps of the gallows just before eight in the morning. He tied his victim's legs together, he slipped the noose over John's head and then the hood. And then James walked over to the lever. He waited there while one of the officials asked John, any last words? From underneath his hood, John said, no, drop away. James Barry knew that this was his cue. He grasped the lever and pulled. It moved just fine, as smoothly as it ever did. The telltale sound of the bolts sliding away underneath the trap door echoed through the coach house. Any second now, the floor beneath John Lee's feet would disappear, leaving him swinging in the air. But nothing, nothing happened. The trap door refused to open below John Lee's feet. James's heart sank. This was the nightmare that had interrupted his sleep for years, and it was coming to life right before his eyes. But for John, it was a dream. The fulfillment of his oath before the court. The Lord will never permit me to be executed. James pulled the noose off of John's neck and ushered him off to one side. He then tested the gallows using sandbags, estimated to weigh as much as John. <laughs> the trap door swung open just fine. The heavy bags tumbled to the ground beneath the gallows. Satisfied that everything was working again, James put John back into position, noose and all. James pulled the lever again, and nothing happened. And now James is absolutely baffled. So he calls out to someone to fetch him a saw and an ax. When they arrive, he moves John from the trap door and heads underneath the gallows, where he starts sawing and hacking away, trying to make the trap door looser. It doesn't make any sense to him, but the only thing that James can figure is that the wood of the door is somehow getting snagged on the platform. 
When he thinks he's loosened it enough, James mounts the stairs once more and repeats everything all over again. And again, nothing happens. By this time, the officials are embarrassed. The chaplain faints, the medical officer on duty refuses to participate in what he now believes is cruel and unusual punishment, making the condemned wait so long on the gallows, the execution is called off. Just nine hours later, John Lee receives a message in his cell. He didn't actually use a phone, but you know. Home Secretary Sir William Harcourt has commuted John's sentence to life in prison. He serves around 20 years then petitions for his release. By 1907, John Lee is a free man and soon relocates to the United States of America. Or at least that's what researchers think. John's trail goes cold after a while. Some people think that he passed away in Devon during World War II. Others say that he lived a nice long life in America. In fact, researchers Mark Holgate and Ian David Waugh, authors of the book, The Man They Could Not Hang, believe that they found his headstone in Milwaukee, Wisconsin's Forest Home Cemetery. But what happened that day in February of 1885? Why did John escape death three separate times? Well, officials ordered that the gallows be examined. It was determined that when the device was moved from the infirmary to the coach house, the drawbar underneath had been misaligned slightly. This caused the hinges on the trap door to seize up and fail to swing properly. But if that's the case, then why did the sandbag test go off without a hitch? And why did both the executioner and the victim dream about the exact same scenario beforehand? That, combined with John Lee's oath in the courtroom and the strong indication that he might have been innocent, all points to the possibility that his life was spared by supernatural forces. Here's the thing. John Lee wasn't the first person who seems to have been rescued by divine intervention. In fact, the exact same scenario unfolded 82 years earlier in Australia. In 1803, a local troublemaker named Joseph Samuels was arrested for the murder of a police officer in Sydney, Australia. Like John Lee, Joseph was arrested through purely circumstantial evidence. You see, the policeman had caught a pair of thieves in the process of stealing a desk filled with money. When he was apprehended later, Joseph's pockets held the same coins that had been confiscated earlier by the murdered policeman. And so Joseph was arrested. Of course, he swore that he was innocent. He said that he had won the coins while gambling. What's more, several witnesses stepped forward to vouch for the fact that Joseph had not only been miles away at the time of the murder, but was also incredibly drunk when the officer lost his life, and in no shape to do any such thing. As in the case of John Lee, none of this satisfied law enforcement. Instead, they arrested both Joseph Samuels and his suspected accomplice, Isaac Simmons, since they had been unable to force Joseph into a confession, the police thought they might be able to coax one out of Isaac by having him watch Joseph's public execution. When the day came, Joseph was brought to the noose in a horse-drawn cart. Unlike in John Lee's execution, there was no trap door to worry about this time. The executioner had Joseph stand up on the cart, drape the noose over his head, and when the time was right, the executioner was to give the driver of the cart a command at which the horses would take off, leaving Joseph Samuels to hang. Well, Joseph was permitted to address the crowd that had gathered. He admitted that he had indeed been the one who had stolen the desk, but he had not murdered the policeman. That act was actually carried out by Isaac. And then Isaac went berserk. He began shouting, trying to drown out Joseph's testimony, but the crowd had heard enough. They began shouting for Joseph's release and for Isaac to be put on trial. But in the commotion, one of the guards accidentally jabbed one of the horses. The animals took off, leaving Joseph swinging back and forth in the noose, gasping for his life. But it was over in the blink of an eye. The rope snapped. It seemed like Joseph's life had been spared. The crowd was growing rowdier by the second, but the official in charge of the proceedings ignored them. In short, he had been given a job today, 
and no last minute claim of innocence was going to make him abandon it. So while the other officers kept the crowd at bay, the head of the operation sent someone for a new rope and called the wagon back around. After the noose was made, they strung Joseph Samuels up again. By now, Joseph is only half conscious. He barely has any idea of what is going on. He can't even stand up anymore, which means that the rope is too short. So a barrel is fetched to go on the cart for Joseph to sit on. He can barely sit upright, so he doesn't fight at all, and he doesn't say another word. He just sits there, waiting for the horses to take off. This time, the process goes off without a hitch. The horse is bolted, the barrel tumbled, and the rope went tight. For a few moments, Joseph's death looked absolutely certain, and then the rope began to unravel. Just a few heartbeats later, it was loose enough for Joseph's feet to barely make contact with the ground. Not enough for him to stand, mind you, but enough for him to summon the last bit of his strength and push up against the tightening of the noose. And now, the crowd is absolutely convinced that they're watching a miracle. Some divine force is intervening to keep an innocent man from dying, and they just grow more and more unruly, calling for Joseph to be cut down. And eventually, he is, but not because the crowd wants it. The official overseeing the execution needs another new rope. A third, brand new noose was put around Joseph Samuel's neck. The horses took off yet again, and again the hanging failed. The rope broke just above Joseph's head. Although his neck took quite the beating and he was wheezing from exhaustion, he was still alive. The official had had enough. He wasted no time. He hopped on his horse and rode straight to his superiors at the governor's office, where he reported the entire incident. Although skeptical, the governor immediately pardoned Joseph Samuels. So what happened here? Although the execution had been canceled, officials were curious as to the cause. They examined all three nooses and concluded that none of them showed any signs of tampering. In fact, the third rope, remember it was brand new, showed itself capable of supporting up to 400 pounds. Other experiments left everyone equally perplexed. All three of the ropes were made up of three multi-cord strands, but even when two of these three had been cut, the ropes still supported the entire amount that they were tested for, meaning that none of them broke during the tests, even when significantly weakened. But everybody who had been in attendance that day swore that each of the ropes that had broken did so effortlessly, almost like they had been severed with a giant, invisible pair of scissors. Eventually, Isaac Simmons was hanged for the murder of the police officer. As for Joseph Samuels, despite the amazing rescue he had managed to pull off, he nonetheless returned to being a criminal and soon wound up serving time in Newcastle. From there, he and several other inmates made a daring escape attempt in a boat and were never heard from again. While most researchers assume that they likely drowned, I like to think that he and his buddies capitalized on Joseph's miraculous good luck and somehow managed to survive. Although John Lee and Joseph Samuels are the most famous people to survive their hangings, looking back a little further offers a few more examples. Some of them even managed to go through a successful execution process only to emerge unscathed. In 1650, 22-year-old Anne Green was working as a servant in the home of Sir Thomas Reed. Well, one thing led to another, and she became pregnant with the child of Sir Thomas's grandson. She had no idea. In fact, she only learned the truth when she lost the child at 18 weeks. In a combination of shock and terror, she covered up the tragedy. When officials learned about what happened, they charged her for murder under an unfair, archaic law saying that she had concealed the pregnancy. Even though the loss of her child had not been her fault, and midwives testified at the trial that the child was too young to have survived on its own, Anne was sentenced to hang in the courtyard of Oxford Castle. The day of her execution, Anne stopped before she reached the gallows and prayed to God, saying that she hoped His Divine Majesty would be pleased to show some remarkable judgment upon her. Then she ascended to where the noose waited. 
She turned and addressed the crowd, speaking of, in her words, the lewdness of the family wherein she lately lived. She then reasserted her innocence and the executioner placed the noose around her neck. The floor gave way and Anne dropped. Her friends rushed to the scaffold, eager to fulfill her dying wish. You see, Anne had told them that the moment she fell, she wanted them to grab hold of her legs and jerk her lower, in the hope that they might help her die quicker and suffer less. Finally, after a full half hour, Anne's body was cut down and placed in a simple wooden casket. She was taken to a pair of doctors, Thomas Willis and William Petty, for a dissection at a medical school. But something strange happened. The moment the coffin was open, neither physician could believe his eyes. Anne Green's chest was moving, ever so slightly. With it came a strange sound, kind of caught in her throat. The doctors quickly abandoned their plans and set to work reviving her. They eventually succeeded. Anne was able to speak after 12 hours. After a full day passed, she was conscious enough to answer the doctor's questions. Anne Green's survival was deemed a miracle by the public, and the officials had no choice but to offer her a full pardon. Anne went on to live a happy life. Bits of her casket were sold as souvenirs, and after settling in a nearby town, she married and had children. Anne's father even charged admission for people to meet the girl who cheated death. The proceeds ended up being enough to settle all of her legal and medical debts. The march towards humane treatment and capital punishment has been long and difficult. While the centuries have seen a lot of advancements in this regard, for a while, hangings were considered the most efficient and least cruel way to dispatch justice. Before that, it was common to burn people alive at the stake. And if you think that John Lee, Joseph Samuels, and Anne Green escaping their executions is wild, then buckle up because the story is absolutely filled with people who somehow managed to escape being burned alive. Although a lot of other methods seem to still work. You see, one of the earliest examples of someone surviving being burned at the stake comes to us from 155 AD. St. Polycarp was condemned to death because he refused to acknowledge the divinity of the Roman emperor. As a result, he was condemned to immolation, or death by burning. An authenticated letter from his followers, some of whom were eyewitnesses, read this. When he had offered up the Amen and finished his prayer, the fireman lighted the fire, and a mighty flame flashing forth, we to whom it was given to see, saw a marvel, yea, and we were preserved, that we might relate to the rest what happened. The fire making the appearance of a vault, like the sail of a vessel filled by the wind, made a wall round about the body of the martyr, and it was there in the midst, not like flesh burning, but like a loaf in the oven, or like gold and silver refined in a furnace. For we perceived such a fragrant smell, as if it were the wafted odor of frankincense or some other precious spice. So at length, the lawless men, seeing that his body could not be consumed by the fire, ordered an executioner to go up to him and stab him with a dagger. And when he had done this, there came forth a quantity of blood so that it extinguished the fire. And all the multitude marveled that there should be so great a difference between the unbelievers and the elect. Another miraculous survival occurred in 1702. King Louis XIV of France had clamped down on civil liberties almost 20 years earlier, and the people had had enough. In what became known as the Camisar Rebellion, French citizens fought to overturn the tyranny that had stripped them of their rights. One of the leaders of the Camisar was a man by the name of Clarisse. To prove their movement was righteous, Clarice actually commanded his followers to set him on fire. Well, a giant pyre was built. Clarice scaled up to the top in front of 600 people. They watched as the other men lit the base and the flames slowly took hold, consuming everything they came in contact with. When they reached Clarice, everyone gasped. His wife screamed, but according to eyewitnesses, Clarice remained calm. In fact, 
he not only survived the flames surrounding him, but he was able to speak the entire time. He preached about the righteousness of their cause, all the while the flames licked higher and higher above his head. His voice did not waver, and he never stopped. Finally, all of the wood was burnt to a crisp, the fire died out, and standing at the top was Clarice, completely unscathed. Even his clothes seemed as fresh as the moment he had climbed to the top of the pile of wood. Unfortunately for Clarice, he could survive fire but not politics. The Kamizar rebellion ended with a whimper rather than a bang, with everyone involved making vague concessions to the king. Few, if any, of their demands were met. So what do you think of these stories? Are we just dealing with happy coincidences, or are these full-fledged miracles? Are divine forces intervening to save the lives of innocent people in these cases? If you or someone you know have survived or are alive because of a divine intervention, let me know what you think down in the comments below. I would love to hear your story. And because you guys have all reached the end of the episode, I want you to all comment down below a short drop and a sudden stop. So that way I know who made it to the end of the video and who didn't. And if you guys enjoy content like we covered in today's video, then what are you waiting for? Slap that like and subscribe button for more content just like this. As always, never forget, I love you all, keep an open mind, and I'll see you all in the very next video.